This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. My name is Rick Renner, and this is Ancient Ephesus, one of my favorite places on the planet. And one reason I love Ephesus and I like to come here is because the grace of God was liberally poured out on this wicked city beginning in the year 52. About the year 52, the Apostle Paul had been ministering in Corinth with his ministry team, with Aquila and Priscilla, and they were finished. The Church of Corinth was established and the Church of Corinth had really been birthed in the power of God. But they knew they were done there and it was time for them to move on and they knew the next city would be Ephesus in the province of Asia. So they boarded a ship in Chincrea, a port city in Greece, and they sailed across the Aegean Sea to the city of Ephesus where they disembarked and began their marvelous ministry in the year 52. And when they came into this city, it must have been very challenging because they knew no one here. There were no believers here. They were coming into an environment where the gospel had never been preached. Completely dark, spiritually very oppressive, filled with all kinds of temples and paganism and idolatry and sexual debaucheries. This really was the epitome of paganism. And Paul, with his team, came walking into the city and they went right to the very heart of the city where they began to preach. And in fact, it wasn't so long after that that they met Apollos and they led Apollos to the Lord and the ministry was birthed right in the very heart of Ephesus and the grace of God was liberally poured out with signs and wonders and mighty deeds. In fact, the Bible talks about special miracles that were performed here and it gave birth to the mighty church of Ephesus, the church which Jesus addresses in Revelation chapter two. He corrects them, he commends them, he tells them what they need to do, just like he's telling us what we need to do today. Jesus is still speaking to us to bring correction to us and to help us so that we'll have great longevity in our spiritual life. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program, my friend. I've been waiting for you, and today we're going to go to the ancient city of Ephesus and see that the grace of God can be poured out there. It can be poured out anywhere, including where you are right now. Just remember that the book of Romans says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds, and that is the story of Ephesus. The grace of God abounded in a wicked environment, and God wants to pour His grace out where you are too. But hey, I'm offering you a brand new series, which is called Take a Tour with Rick, and it's my tour of the ancient city of Ephesus. Many people have asked me to take them on a tour, and I cannot do it. So I decided to bring the tour to you, and my friends, you will devour this. It'll be good for your heart, It'll be good for your mind. It will just cause the New Testament to come alive for you. So order yours today. It's 10 parts and it comes in multiple formats. And we're offering you the book that accompanies it, which is called A Light in Darkness, Seven Messages to the Seven Churches. And in this amazing book, you'll see pictures, photos, full color illustrations, and all kinds of art, which will make you feel like you have really stepped into the first century so that you can see and experience what believers experienced then. And again, if they could be victorious in their time, then my friend, indeed, we can be victorious in our time as well say amen. But today, we're going to take a quick tour through Paul's ministry in the city of Ephesus. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 18. And when Paul concluded his ministry in Corinth, he went down to the city of Cancrea, and we read that in verse 18. After and after Paul had tarried there a good while yet, then took he his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria with him, Priscilla and Aquila. They went down to the port city of Cancrea, which was not far from Corinth. They boarded a ship and sailed across the sea, and they came to Ephesus. That's what we read 
in verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And for a very short period of time, Paul reasoned with the Jews in the city of Ephesus. But Paul had made a vow that he would go on to the city of Jerusalem. So he fulfilled his vow. He left Aquila and Priscilla there in this big, wicked, dark city by themselves. And he went on to Jerusalem. But while he was gone, something very serious took place. And we read that beginning in verse 24. And the Bible says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, but knowing only the baptism of John. So when the Bible says he spoke eloquently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John, it means that this Apollos had been baptized by John, believing that one day the Messiah was going to come, but he had never been informed that the Messiah had come. And he ventured into the open air synagogue in the city of Ephesus. And the open air synagogue at that time was where the library of Celsus was later built. And when he came there, he began to teach and Aquila and Priscilla were there and they heard him and they were quite impressed with him. In fact, the Bible tells us in verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, listen to this, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. In other words, they said, hey, Apollos, everything you're saying is just fabulous, but we need to give you a detail you don't know. The Messiah that you're believing will one day come, he has come, and they explained the way of God to him more perfectly. And the Bible tells us in verse 27, and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, their brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scripture that Jesus was the Christ. This is the face first major event that took place in the open air synagogue where the library of Celsus was later constructed. But then we come to chapter 19 and verse 1 and we find that Paul returns to Ephesus. On his first arrival to Ephesus, he arrived by ship in the great harbor of Ephesus. But when he returned, he came through the upper Magnesia gate. And that's what we read in chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, that means the inner regions, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Now, when people see that word disciples, they immediately believe these were New Testament believers. But in fact, these were were disciples who had been baptized by John, just like Apollos. They were believing that one day the Messiah would come, but they didn't know that the Messiah had come. Apparently, they had made a trip to Israel, and while they were there, they heard the preaching of John. They were baptized by John, released their faith that one day the Messiah would come, and then they went back home to Ephesus. And while they were in Ephesus, the Messiah came. The full ministry of Jesus took place, but because they were in Ephesus, no one ever informed them of that development. And now Paul finds them. And the Bible tells us in verse 2, Paul said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We've not so much heard whether there is any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Hmm, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. And then said Paul, John baptized verily with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. And then Paul said, hey, here's the good news. He came and his name is Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, this was the first time they heard the news that Jesus had come. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and they prophesied. And verse seven says, and all the men were about 12. And we even know where this occurred. It probably happened on what some call the South Road or the Magnesia Road in the upper part of Ephesus. But then you come to verse eight to see the next development. 
And Paul went into the synagogue. Now wait, where's the synagogue? The synagogue was there in Philosopher's Square, where today the Library of Celsus stands. You can still go there. That really was an open-air synagogue when Paul began his ministry in Ephesus. And he went into this synagogue, an open-air synagogue, and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading things concerning the kingdom of God. Verse 9, But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Surely this must have been a very disappointing moment for the Apostle Paul. He spent three months trying to reach the Jews in the open air synagogue. And at the end of three months, after reasoning with them and disputing with them, they said, we've had enough of this. So Paul said, fine, I'm going to leave. Sometimes a moment comes when you realize it's time for you to move on. And this probably was a very difficult moment for Paul because he really wanted those Jews to repent. But they weren't going to repent, so he gathered those who had believed. And the Bible says he entered into the school of Tyrannus. Well, guess what? The school of Tyrannus was about 15 steps away from the open air synagogue. In fact, today, if you go to the city of Ephesus and you go to the Celsus Library, which was the location of the open air synagogue right to the left, you'll see a set of steps that go up to what was the school of Tyrannus. Paul, it seems, broke away from them, but he didn't go very far. He was so close to them that he could still capture some Jews as they were on their way to the open air synagogue. But he entered into the school of Tyrannus. Tyrannus probably was a pagan, and it seems this was a school of education. And this school of education was empty and was available, especially during the middle hours of the day. And during those middle hours, Paul occupied that space. And the Bible tells us in verse 10, and this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Verse 11, listen to this, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Well, all miracles are special, but these miracles were of a special nature that the Bible calls them special miracles. These were out of the ordinary miracles. And the verse goes on to say in verse 12, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. And when the Bible says they took from his body handkerchiefs or aprons, it's really referring to his dress. The people who lived and worked in that particular part of Ephesus were well to do. Paul dressed in order to speak to his audience correctly. You know, you have to be appropriate for who you're speaking to. If you're speaking to the president of a nation, you don't go in jeans and a sweatshirt. You dress appropriately. Well, Paul knew he had to dress appropriately to dress the people who lived in that part of Ephesus. So he wore headgear, which was a beautiful garment wrapped around his head. He wore a piece which was wrapped around his waist. And the anointing of God was so heavy on him that they took pieces of that garment from his head and from around his waist and took them to those that were sick. And the Bible says the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Went out in Greek is a form of the word ek. It means the evil spirits made an exit. Then you come to verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, these are traveling Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure thee by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. They didn't know Jesus. They just saw that Paul was effectively using the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, Paul had authority over spirits. So they said, hey, we'll try that too. And the Bible tells us in verse 14, and there were seven sons of one Sceva. The word Sceva is not his real name. That is a nickname which was given to him by Luke when Luke wrote this chapter. The word Sceva means left-handed, low-level scoundrel in the opinion of Luke, this was a scoundrelous Jew. Why? Because this Jew had become one of the chief priests in the temple of Diana. He had totally defected from his faith. And Luke says he's a left-handed, low-level scoundrel. And the Bible says, And the evil spirit answered and said, verse 15, 
Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, overcame them, and prevailed against them, and they fled out of that house naked and wounded. The word wounded in Greek is traumatizo. It's where we get the word traumatized. These men were traumatized. They had tried to use the name of Jesus without knowing Jesus. But because of this event, verse 17 says, And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And look at the result in verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed. The Greek actually says they were coming and confessing, which means they were so willing to repent. They were repenting as they were walking to the altar. And many that believed were coming and confessing and showed their deeds. The word deeds is the Greek word proxus. It describes all the elements they use in occult worship and occult activity. And that's why verse 15 says, many of them also, which use curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it was 50,000 pieces of silver. The books that are referred to in this verse were called Ephesian letters. Not like the book of Ephesus in the New Testament, these were particular documents which contained spells and incantations. They were very, very expensive, and they were literally called Ephesian letters, and they were very well known in the city of Ephesus. And it was believed that if you had one of these Ephesian letters filled with incantations and spells, that it gave you power in the spirit realm, and people paid a lot of money for them. But now they brought them and they're burning them and right in front of them, they're burning their past. They're burning all their connections to demonic occult activity. And here we find their repentance was sincere and it was permanent. And the Bible says in verse 20, and so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. But then when you come down to verse 23, we find something happened. The Bible says, and the same time there arose no small stir about that way for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith which made silver shrines for Diana, that is actually the goddess Artemis, and brought no small gain unto the craftsman who when he called together the workmen of like occupation said, Sirs, we know that by this craft or by making these idols, we have made our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. So many people were repenting in Ephesus while Paul was there that it was jeopardizing the sale of these idols. And Demetrius, who was the head of the Silver Workers Guild, brought all the guild workers together, and we even know where they met. They met in the great theater of Ephesus, which you can still visit today. And they met there and began to raise their voices against the Apostle Paul. In fact, let's continue. It says in verse 27, so that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great Dottis Diana or Artemis should be despised. The word despised really means to be disassembled and destroyed. And her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all of Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. These were actually the crying screams of a dying religion because it was as if the gospel had put a stake through the very heart of this vile religion and it was dying. And these were the crying screams of that evil religion. And my friend, that is the power of preaching the gospel. The gospel really drives out darkness. And verse 29 says, And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And then when you get to verse 31, you find something totally amazing. And certain of the chief of Asia, in Greek it is the word Asiarch. The Asiarchs were the men who served as the 
the chief priests in the cult of the emperor. There were only 10 of them. And now one of them, we're talking about a man that is really pagan. He's the leader of a pagan temple, but yet he so respects the apostle Paul that the Bible says that he and other friends sent unto Paul desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. And they stopped Paul from going into the theater where his life would have been endangered. And we know from early historical documents that at that moment, they took Paul to the top of the hill, to what today is called the Grotto of the Apostle Paul, and they kept him there for a number of days while he waited for a ship to sail into the harbor that he could embark, which would take him away from Ephesus and into safety. And we read that his ministry ended in chapter 20, verse 1. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. But Paul spent nearly three years in the city of Ephesus with the power of God driving out darkness, a great revival as thousands upon thousands of people were saved. And in the midst of that dark, dark city, God poured out his grace, which is what we read in Romans chapter five, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And my friend, if God's grace could abound in Ephesus, God's grace can abound where you are right to right now. And when I come back in just a moment, I'm going to pray for that abounding grace to erupt in your life. People often call or write to ask, when will Rick take his next tour group to Ephesus? We want to go. So many people have made this request that Rick decided to bring Ephesus to you in the new series, Take a Tour with Rick, Ephesus. After years of praying and planning, Rick finally went to Ephesus to film this personal tour for you. And he gives the entire tour through the eyes of the Apostle Paul and Aquila and Priscilla as they saw Ephesus when they first arrived there to start the church at Ephesus. With permission from local authorities, even off-limits sites were open to Rick so he could take his film crew to show you sites that even tourists are not able to see. This is truly a one-of-a-kind tour, but it's not just a tour. As Rick walks you through the paths of Ephesus, he teaches all along the way. This 10-part documentary-type visual series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. We're also offering you the book, A Light in Darkness. This beautiful 800-page book features on-location photography with added artwork and illustrations to enhance the in-depth scriptural teaching that makes the early New Testament come alive on every page. Rick reveals insights into the ancient world and the disturbing realities that early believers faced as the church began to flourish in a pagan world. This book is available right now for just $80. Don't miss this special offer. The visual series, Take a Tour with Rick, Ephesus, and the book, A Light in Darkness. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and today I want to give you a report about what's happening in the construction of our new studio. Work still continues. It's taken a little bit longer than we anticipated because of all the sanctions that have stopped materials from coming to Russia, but we're doing it step by step. And today they're installing the fireplace, which is going to be the centerpiece of this big room where we're going to be filming programs. But in addition to this, there's gonna be another set over here and another set over there. So many angles and opportunities to film teaching that people can trust in this room. But of course, this is just one room. But I have to tell you, I'm pretty excited about this room. To think that TV programs with the Word of God are going to be filmed right here. And when I look around this room, you can see this electrical grid, grid that's gonna hold all the lights. It's on electrical pulleys, so it goes up, it goes down. It's just going to have everything we need to film the teaching of the Word of God. But hey, there's more than this. Let me show you. Well, I know you can't tell from what it looks like right now, but this really is gonna be one of the smaller studios, and this is gonna be Denise's studio because Denise is reaching women everywhere with her programming. And right from this spot, Denise is going to be sending her teaching to women all over the world. But hey, there's another set in addition to this one. This is our third studio in this new building. You may say, why do you need three studios? Because we're filming a lot of programs. 
Right now, we can only film one program at a time. We have to set it up, take it down, but this will enable us to do multiple things at one time. But on both floors of this building, there are multiple offices. In fact, there are 18 offices, and in all of these offices, people are going to be doing editing, writing, producing programs, working with our network. It is amazing the activity that's going to take place in this building. And it's not about buildings, it's about people. People need the teaching of the Word of God. But it's your generous gifts that have helped us to build this and we will complete it. But right now we're in phase three of our ministry, which is paying off our Tulsa ministry headquarters. We want to pay it off because the moment it's paid off, all of those funds will be released for us to broadcast the teaching of the Word of God around the world. And that's really our goal, to get the gospel and to teach people the Bible all over the world. They're just crying out for it and they're waiting for that signal to come with the answer that they've been seeking. So please help us as we finish phase three to pay off the Tulsa facility. Well, today I have given you a review of the Apostle Paul's ministry in Ephesus and how the church in Ephesus was established in the power of the Holy Ghost. God's grace was really poured out there. But hey, I have a series that I want you to order, which is called Take a Tour with Rick. Ephesus. And in this 10-part series, I walk you through the entire city of Ephesus so you see it like Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla saw it when they first arrived there. You will just devour this. And we're also offering you right now my book, which is called A Light in Darkness. The director of the Pergamum Museum said it's one of the most professional books ever produced on these subjects. And my friend, when you get it, you're going to say, wow, this is like an encyclopedia about life for believers in the first century. It will make the Bible come alive for you. And it's just page after page of full color photographs, art, and illustrations. It's a lot more than text. Many people use it as a coffee table book because it's so beautiful. But my friend, even if you don't read it all at once, little by little, you'll flip through the pages and you'll find what you need. It is just loaded and I want you to have it. But hey, if you need prayer, please reach out to us. We're people of prayer. We believe in prayer and we want to pray for you. And I want to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that where darkness is, you pour out your grace. And I'm asking you to do what you do, that you would cause your grace to abound, that it would erupt in the life of my precious friend. I pray for abounding grace to come in the name of Jesus. Amen. Wow, we've covered a lot today and it's been good. But remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, which says, where the word of a king is, there is power. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.